Okay, good evening everybody. I am very, very happy to open the third public session of our Tager International Conference on uh, Feminism in the Three Abrahamic uh, Religions. And in this session, we have the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to host a keynote presentation by the Right Honorable Baroness Brenda Hale of Richmond, former president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. And without further ado, I uh, would like to give the floor now to Professor Amnon Albeck, rector of bar -Ilan University. Okay, good evening, everyone. So I wish first to thank the hosts, the Tager family, and the organizers of the meeting, the Rockman Center, and the Gender Studies Program at bar -Ilan University, the Open University, and the Institute for the Study of Relations between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, which I assume is in the center of this um, conference. I'm especially honored to welcome our special guest and tonight's speaker, Lady Brenda Hale, former president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court and a recipient of the 2021st honorary doctorate from bar -Ilan University. So it's a very special evening and I'm very happy to have you here with us. The Bible, the source of the Abrahamic religions is considered very patriarchic, but I would dare say, and I hope I don't step on any toes here, uh, at the, at the same time, it is very feminist. In most, if not all encounters of a man and a woman, the latter, the latter is clearly superior. In tribute to the 10 commandments, which we're going to read in the Torah next Saturday, this coming Shabbat, I'll mention only 10 examples out of many more who, who present this point. And the first one uh, has to do with Abraham and God tells him, to listen or to accept whatever Sarah tells, tells him to do, or whatever Sarah says, listen to her without any questions. And Rashi, the great commentator, explains that Sarah is at a higher prophetic level than Abraham, which is counterintuitive, but that's what we learn. Rivka, the second generation, decides to marry Yitzhak immediately in the right direct opposition to her family, especially her brother, Lavan who wants her to stay for at least 10 months or a year at home. And needless to say, who won this uh, disagreement? Let's jump 400 years later. She find Pua, the two midwives in Egypt, courageously disobey Pharaoh's orders and save the lives of the newborn baby boys. And they're strong enough to stand in front of Pharaoh and give a very good explanation why they couldn't do anything. So they're also very resourceful, not only courageous. If you go a little further, Tsipora, Moses' wife, saves his life, exhibiting unusual dispassion and control in the face of death. And I wonder how many men would react so calmly in, 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 in this case. Miriam, Moses' sister, it's described in many places in the Bible as a leader equal to her famous brothers, Moses and Aaron. Let's go further away and maybe a little different example, Rahav of Jericho, uh, who may be someone at the edges of society, but she's extremely clever and resourceful in saving both the two Israeli spies and her own family. And in between, she exhibits a very sharp geopolitical analysis of the situation. Uh, she could be a very good uh, uh, geopolitician nowadays. In the story of Manoach and his wife, the parents of Shimshon, Samson, despite the fact that the husband is named and his wife remains in the shadow, she doesn't have even a name, but clearly the wife is the more active and the cleverer among the two. And, and there's no doubt about it in the story. Dvorah, the prophet, and we just read her story last Shabbat on the Haftarah, had to escort Barak in the war against Isra and the Canaanites. Barak would not lead the army without her. And then Sisra is suddenly killed by another woman, Yael. So clearly in this case, the two women plays the major role and Barak is only a messenger. 
let's go ahead. Abigail, calm and rational prevents the, or saves David from murdering your husband, Naval. Again, she's a smart person. He's a redheaded, uh, behaves without thinking too much and she prevents the murder. Eventually she marries the king. And you may say that even this, uh, um, this, this may be a uh, paternalist reward, but maybe she organized everything. And finally, getting in the mood of our next holiday, let, less than a month ahead of us, it's been a year since we started with, with, with the COVID-19 um, episode. Estelle, very smart and resourceful, sets the stage for the fall of Amman and saves her people in the Persian empire. And Estelle controls, in fact, three men, the king, Amman, and Mordechai. So I think that these examples clarify uh, what I wanted to say, women are superior, at least in the Bible. Um, if I want to jump here and now, I would like to indicate the special character of Barilan University as an institution that cherishes, cherishes the Jewish values, which in my mind go together with the values of providing equal opportunities and promoting, promoting uh, equality. I would only mention in this respect that I succeeded a woman rector, uh, just finished her position of about four months ago. Um, she was the only woman rector in these early universities. Um, and we have many uh, women scientists who served and are serving as deans and department heads. And in honor of, of our special guest, Lady Hale, I would only mention that the current president of the Israeli Supreme Court is also a woman. Uh, but this has nothing to do with Barilan, of course. I'm sure you all enjoyed a very interesting meeting in the last two days. Tonight's presentation is promising to be just as good, I hope. So I wish you all an interesting continuation of the conference that I understand will continue also tomorrow. A conference that I hope will bring people and religions together to each other, especially in this COVID-19 period that forces us to keep distant from each other. So this conference is coming right on time. So I wish we all to stay healthy and enjoy the upcoming presentation. Good evening. Thank you very much, Professor Albeck, uh, for these very interesting uh, opening remarks. I think that we could uh, devote a whole uh, separate session to discuss, uh, I believe we do have some differences of opinions here about the interpretation that you um, gave to these um, examples, but uh, we'll, do it, uh, we'll, do, we'll do it on another opportunity. And um, I would now like to give the floor to uh, Professor Oren Perez, Dean of the Faculty of Law, which is the home for the Rackman Center, um, one of the um, hosts of this uh, conference. Uh, Professor Perez, thank you very much, uh, Ruthie. Um, so let me start just by uh, uh, extending my uh, thanks uh, first to uh, Romy and uh, Esther Tager for uh, uh, supporting uh, this uh, conference, and they are old friends uh, uh, of the faculty. Uh, and uh, second uh, to uh, Baroness uh, uh, Brenda Hale, uh, the former president of the UK Supreme Court. Uh, it's indeed uh, uh, an honor to have you. I'm, I'm just sorry that uh, we couldn't uh, uh, host you in person at, at Bar-Ilan, uh, but th this, is, this is the life now. Uh, and also to, to Rackman uh, uh, Center, uh, the, the main hosts of the, of the conference. Uh, I just want to say, a few very short uh, words about the, the multicultural uh, uh, dilemma. And I think one, one of the challenges of, of uh, uh, multiculturalism, both in regard to feminism, but also in, in other uh, aspects uh, uh, like environmental law, which is my, my field, is the, is the challenge of translating between different uh, uh, perspectives and how to accommodate different uh, 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 perspectives. And one of the uh, tragic, I think, roles of the court is, is that it has to take sides between different uh, perspectives. And through that, sometimes 
uh, uh, to do them uh, un, uh, unjustice uh, uh, because uh, choosing between perspectives is, is, is difficult. And the corona crisis provide us with various such uh, examples. Just yesterday, there was a huge uh, funeral in Israel of the uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, community, which is uh, uh, for a, a non-religious secular uh, person like myself is something we simply cannot understand. But I think from one of the uh, lessons of this, of this crisis in Israel is that the other side see us, the, the other side as someone who simply don't understand their view. And our attempt to impose our standard on them is to do something which is not just to their cultural perspectives. And uh, sometimes the law is not the right mechanism to resolve these uh, multicultural uh, clashes. And, uh, and of course, sometimes the court has no choice but to do uh, to resolve these, these clashes. Uh, and this is uh, really the difficult uh, role of a judge, uh, which is, uh, I believe Lady Hale knows know this better than us. So again, congratulations for this very interesting uh, conference. And I'm looking forward to hear what uh, Lady Hale will have to say uh, later this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Perez. And now uh, we will hear another perspective about our keynote speaker uh, tonight from uh, Romy Tager. Esther and Romy Tager are longtime friends and supporters of the law faculty and of the Rackman Center. And yesterday we heard from Esther, and now we have the privilege of hearing from uh, Romy Tager. Um, Romy Tager, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Professor Halprin Kadari. It's my privilege to be introducing Lady Hale to you all this evening. Uh, as her formal title, Baroness Hale of Richmond indicates, she was born and brought up in the north of England in the ancient Yorkshire town of Richmond. She excelled at school, but because her head teacher told her that she was not clever enough for history, she successfully applied to study law at Cambridge University where she graduated at the top of her predominantly male class with a starred first class honors degree. Although she qualified as a barrister, she did not practice because she was persuaded to take up an academic career. She joined Manchester University as a law lecturer, ultimately being uh, appointed a professor uh, in their law faculty. The titles of some of her books, Family Law and Society, Mental Health Law and Women in the Law reflect the breadth of her scholarship in the fields of family and equality law. She was the first woman and indeed the youngest person to be appointed to the Law Commission, which is the independent body responsible to review, research and promote reforms uh, in the law. Lady Hell was responsible for the work that led to what became the Children Act 1989 which radically reformed the duties and responsibilities of the courts, local government authorities, and parents in relation to children, and anchored in our law the fundamental principle that the interests of the child are paramount. After leaving the Law Commission, Lady Hale was appointed as a judge of the High Court in England. She was the first such appointment from academia rather than the practicing bar. She was assigned to the family division where she immediately made her mark in the sensitive and challenging work of that court. After only five years, she was promoted to the Court of Appeal as only the second woman to be appointed to that court, where her impressive, carefully crafted and incisive judgments contributed to the development of a wide range of areas of the law, including human rights and equality, not just her special, specialist field of family law. That led to her appointment as the first woman judge to what was then the highest court of appeal in the United Kingdom, the House of Lords, which is when she became a Baroness. If you're wondering whether she is a feminist, the new Baroness Hale chose as the motto on her coat of arms, Omnia Feminae Aquisimiae, which is Latin for women are equal to everything. When the House of Lords was replaced by the new United Kingdom Supreme Court in 2009, she was again the only woman amongst the 12 new justices of the Supreme Court. 
Lady Hale became the deputy president of that court in June 2013, and four years later, she was appointed as the court's third and only woman, pre uh, and only woman president. When she was sworn in, she was joined by Lady Black as the second woman justice to be appointed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's justices also serve as the judges of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which hears appeals from many Commonwealth countries and British overseas and dependent territories. Shortly after her appointments in 2017 as president of the Supreme Court, I had the privilege and challenge as a barrister of appearing in front of Lady Hale presiding in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on an appeal from the Court of Appeals of Trinidad and Tobago. Unlike the Supreme Court, which only hears appeals in important cases, giving rise to points of law of general public importance, the appeals that come before the Judicial Committee range from capital murder appeals from the Caribbean, major constitutional appeals from Commonwealth countries, to cases involving relatively mundane, mundane facts with little legal interest from states and territories that allow any significant case to be appointed, to be appealed to the Judicial Committee. Uh, in that case, I represented an oil company that had been sued for the environmental damage and injury to health alleged to have been caused by a leaking capped oil well in Trinidad. This was probably one of the least challenging appeals that the Supreme Court justices had dealt with for quite a while, with little of interest and no challenge to Lady Hale and her colleagues. I have two lasting memories of that case. First, the way that Lady Hale actively engaged with the issues raised in the appeal as if they were the most challenging points of law with which the Supreme Court uh, has had to grapple for a long time. And secondly, I cannot forget the courtesy, patience and fairness as well as the intellectual rigor that she displayed throughout the hearing. Lady Hale retired last year on reaching her compulsory retirement, retirement age. She's since become a, a, an honorary professor at University College London, of which both Esther and I are graduates, as well as a fellow of Lady Margaret Hall in the University of Oxford. She spent lockdown writing two books. Her memoir, which is going to be published later this year, apparently with the title Spider Woman, with obvious reference to the spider brooches which made her an unlikely celebrity, celebrity in the UK. The other book will deal with and explain the importance of the law, why individuals and not just commercial enterprises need it, and why it sometimes fails. Today, Baroness Hale is presenting us with a view from the bench on legal dilemmas and religious feminism, where the need for the law's protection cannot be overstated and must not be allowed to fail. Thank you so much, Romy, for so beautifully presenting our keynote speaker this evening. From my own perspective, I'd just like to add my two cents or two shillings, whatever. Um, one point um, about uh, Lady Hale's um, feminism and um, feminist uh, judicial approach and as you just said, um, she has been the first ever, and in fact, for most of her term on the bench, the only female justice on the House of Lords and later the UK Supreme Court, and the first ever, and thus far the only president of the court, there can be little doubt that she played a pathbreaking role in introducing a feminist perspective into judicial decisions in the UK. And just by way of example, what we actually mean by when we say feminist judging, we mean contextual analysis, we mean compassionate and empathic reasoning, asking the woman's question that is constantly considering the gendered implications of the matters that come before the court. And Justice Hale's jurisprudence is a truly quintessential presentation of these attributes that are considered to be feminist judging at its best. And we're truly fortunate to have Lady Hale tonight with us. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the presentation of Lady Hale, who will speak about the legal dilemmas in religious feminism, a view from the bench. 
And following the presentation, we will be able to have a discussion with Lady Hale. So I would like, I uh, invite the audience now to um, post um, questions uh, through the Q&A icon, which is uh, at the bottom of your screen. These questions will um, get to uh, me as the moderator of the session, and then I will be able to read them out and have Lady Hale um, engage with, with them. Um, so this will follow the um, actual lecture. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you. I hadn't thought much about the relationship between feminism and religion until Professor Halperin Kadari invited me to take part in this conference. So I'm very grateful to her for introducing me to the subject. I take religious feminism to be the attempt of feminists, both women and men, to reconcile their religious beliefs and practices with the belief that women are the equals of men, entitled to equal respect and dignity, to equality of opportunity in the political, social, economic and cultural life of their country, to freedom from discrimination and to equality before the law. In short, to everything that the United Nations <laughs> Convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women says that the law should secure for women. Reading that convention once more, it strikes me that religion is the elephant in the room. There are nods towards the elimination of customs and practices which discriminate against women, and the elimination of stereotyped concepts of the roles of men and women at all levels of education, but nowhere is it acknowledged that religion is one of the greatest propagators of discriminatory practices and stereotypical attitudes. Yet many, nay most of us, have been brought up in one of the world's great religious faiths and would like to be able to reconcile the two. A word, therefore, about where I come from. I was brought up in and I'm still a practicing member of the Church of England. The Church of England is a notoriously flexible church. There is remarkably little doctrine, no dietary laws, and hardly any traditional practices. Yet when I was growing up, women were definitely not regarded as the equals of men. The epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians commanded wives to submit themselves to their husbands. Quote, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything." End quote. Thus, in the version of the marriage service in the Book of Common Prayer, the wife promised to obey and to serve her husband, as well as to love, honour and keep him in sickness and in health. A revision in 1928 dropped the promises to obey and to serve, but both versions were still in use when I married in 1968. And of course, women couldn't become priests in the Church of England until 1994. Might I have tried to become a priest had it been possible? The church and the law have quite a lot in common. We like ceremonial, we like dressing up in archaic robes, we like the sound of our own voices, and we like poring over, analyzing and discussing our authoritative sources. These sources do, of course, present the greatest challenge to religious feminists. But the standard answer is that they have to be read in the cultural context of the time. St. Paul was a Jew who was gradually adapting to the more egalitarian message that Jesus had brought. The church should be like a constitution. As the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council said, when deciding that women were persons in the Constitution of Canada, even though it had been written in 1867, quote, the British North America Act planted in Canada a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits, end quote. The problem that we face is that while some faiths, including mine, are prepared to adopt that position, many others are not. There have been several times in my judicial career when I have had to reconcile the apparently opposing forces of religious belief and feminism. Most prominent was the case of the Queen on the application of Shabina Begum against the governors of Denby High School in 2006. 
This was a school for both boys and girls aged 11 to 16. The pupils were very ethnically diverse, but a large majority were Muslims. The head teacher was of Bengali Muslim origin. She believed that school uniform played an important part in securing high standards by promoting a positive sense of communal identity. The school uniform had been carefully worked out in consultation with the local community. It included an option to wear the shalwar kameez and an Islamic headscarf in the school colours. The imams of the local mosques had approved. Shabina Begum wore this happily for two years until she reached the age of nearly 14. Then she wanted to wear the jilbab instead. The school refused to allow her to do so and she refused to go to school unless it did. After she had missed more than a year of schooling, she brought proceedings claiming that the school had violated her right to manifest her religion in accordance with Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Three of the five judges in the House of Lords, then the highest court in the United Kingdom, held that there had been no interference with her Article 9 rights because she had chosen to attend the school knowing full well what its uniform policy was. If she had objected, she could have gone to another school. I was one of the two who disagreed. It was very unlikely that she had chosen the school for herself or that when she started there, she knew what her view of appropriately modest dress would be when she reached the age of 14. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has since agreed that there can be an interference despite the option to go somewhere else. But I agreed with the other judges that the interference was justified as a proportionate means of protecting the rights and freedoms of others. My reasons were rather different from the other judges. I had done a bit of extra reading. From this, it was clear that the knee-jerk Western response, that all elements of Islamic dress were imposed upon women to demonstrate their inferior status, was an oversimplification. There were women who deliberately chose to adopt Islamic dress, particularly the hijab, quote, as a mark of her defiant political identity and also as a way of regaining control over her body, end quote. It was a way of telling the men and the boys to treat her with respect. On the other hand, of course, there was a type of fundamentalism which used the proper behavior of women to signify the difference between those who belong and those who did not belong to the fundamentalist group and to perpetuate the inferior status of women over the generations. So if an adult woman freely chooses to adopt a particular dress code, it was not for others who disapprove or are even offended by it to prevent her. There is an analogy here with freedom of speech. We should not interfere merely because it causes us offence. But it was different in schools. The uniform dress code could play a part in smoothing over ethnic, social and religious divisions. It could also help to support young women to adopt and how far to distance themselves from their dominant culture. The crucial evidence for me was that other Muslim girls in the school had asked it not to change the policy. They were afraid that if Shabina were allowed to wear the jilbab, they no, would be put under pressure by their family to do the same, even though they did not want to do so. It would mark them out from other Muslims as being adherents of an extremist group. Thus, Shabina was denied her agency in order to protect the agency of others. But of course, no one really knew whether the agency was hers or her older brothers, who'd been a prime mover in her dispute with the school. There may be other reasons why it's permissible to deny a woman the right to wear what she wishes to wear for religious reasons. In the family division of the High Court, I had to try a child care case in which the social services alleged that a young baby's serious head injuries had been caused non-accidentally by one or both of his parents. His father was a doctor from Pakistan who had come to the UK to train for membership of the Royal College of Physicians. His mother was an arts graduate from Pakistan. They had decided that she would go into full purda while they were in the UK. That meant a jilbab, a niqab, a hijab, 
and a black gauze shroud covering the whole of their head and upper body. Parents are compellable witnesses in care cases, and it was essential that I heard her evidence. But we had an easy solution. Care cases are held in private. The judge was a woman. Counsel for the social services was a woman. Counsel for the child's guardian ad litem, an independent social worker appointed to safeguard the child's best interests, was a woman. The two counsel representing the parents were men, but it was agreed that she could give evidence screened from them, but from nobody else. Thus, the only male who could see her face was her husband, and the only people who could not see her were her own counsel. That left me in little doubt of the importance of seeing the face of a witness giving evidence. This mother's love for her children was quite apparent. So too was the fact that, from time to time, she was repeating a rehearsed script rather than giving me her true recollection of what had taken place. Other courts do not have the same easy solution. In September 2013, a male Crown Court judge was confronted by a woman defendant charged with witness intimidation, who appeared in the dock wearing a burqa and a niqab. He was concerned only about the niqab. One potential problem is identification, making sure that you have the right person in the dock. But that could be solved by a female police officer who knew the defendant, seeing her in private without her niqab and giving evidence that she was sure that the person in the dock was the person accused. The more serious problems were whether she should be uncovered while giving evidence so that the jury would be able to assess her credibility and generally during the trial so that the jury would be able to watch her reactions to what was going on when others were giving evidence or counsel were making their submissions or the judge was delivering his summing up. The judge ruled that she was free to wear the niqab during the trial except while giving evidence that she couldn't give evidence wearing the niqab, but she could give evidence behind a screen, shielding her from public view, but not from the view of the judge, jury and counsel. He also ruled that no drawing, sketch or other image of any kind, while her face was uncovered, could be made, disseminated or published outside court. His conclusions are now largely reflected in the Equal Treatment Bench Book, which gives guidance to trial judges. Islamic sources agree that it is not contrary to Sharia law for a woman to uncover her face when she is giving testimony in court, or for a male magistrate or judge to look at her in order to identify who she is, to make assessments as to her credibility, where this is an issue, and to protect the rights of all concerned. But there are disadvantages to wearing a niqab in court. So how are we to know? whether this is a genuinely free choice that she has made. Might she and others in her situation, like the other schoolgirls at Denby High School, be quietly relieved if the law did not allow them this choice? Someone told me that after my judgment in the child care case, when the parents were walking away from court, the mother threw off her veil and started berating her husband. So what are we to make of that? Conflicts between the dress code which a woman or girl wishes to adopt for religious reasons, and the demands of school uniform or court proceedings may seem trivial. Much less so are the substantive conflicts between secular law and religious law, particularly in the context of family relationships, because religious law is so often predicated on an unequal relationship between the sexes. Religious feminists have sometimes turned to the secular law to help them, in the United Kingdom, along with other places, Orthodox Jewish women whose husbands refused to give them a get when they were divorced in the secular courts turned to the secular law for help. The consequences in Jewish law of refusing them a get are dire. They're not free to remarry. If they do remarry, they will be seen as adulteresses and any children they have will be seen as illegitimate. Campaigners argued that English law recognised marriages solemnised according to the usages of the Jews as valid marriages. It was prepared to dissolve those marriages when they had irretrievably broken down, whereas religious law was not. The religious law could not be changed, whereas the secular law could. 
So, the argument went, the secular law should do something about the problem. But that something must not amount to coercion. The husband must be, must give the get of his own free will. The campaign gathered strength in the 1990s when we were trying to reform the English law of divorce so as to remove the pressure it places upon one party to allege that the other party has misbehaved. I found it all very troubling. On the one hand, the woman was placed in an intolerable situation, especially if the man was responsible for the breakdown of the marriage, yet was using the refusal of a get as a bargaining tool in the divorce settlement or simply acting out of spite and vindictiveness. On the other hand, the problem was created by a religious law which was clearly based on the patriarchal principle that the wife was subject to her husband's rule, even a type of property. Was it not for the religious law to solve the problem? English law had abandoned the patriarchal principle long ago. Should it be pandering to it now? Moreover, if secular law moved to accommodate one religious doctrine, would there not be pressure for it to move to accommodate another? Specifically, the Christian view that, quote, those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, end quote. And thus to deny divorce to anyone who had married in a Christian religious ceremony. The Church of England had adopted a more enlightened view since the 1960s, but the same might not be said of the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. The campaign has won. In 2002, a new provision was added to our divorce law. A divorce is granted in two stages. The decree nisi, a provisional unless decree, and a decree absolute which finally brings the marriage to an end. If the couple have been married in accordance with the usages of the Jews, the court has power, once a decree nisi has been granted, to order that it shall not be made absolute until both parties agree that the necessary steps to dissolve the marriage in accordance with Jewish usage have been taken. In other words, the husband cannot get a decree absolute unless he gives the wife a get. Denying a person something he wants in order to encourage him to behave properly is not seen as forcing him to do it. But this is not much help if it is the wife who wants the divorce and he does not. However, there is a decided case where, as well as ordering the husband to pay his wife a large lump sum, the court ordered him to make periodical payments to her until he had given her a get. The court had power to do this, but would it cross the religious line into coercion? The new section had the support of the whole Jewish community. There is a provision to extend it to other prescribed religious usages where the same problem arises, but so far, this has not happened. In fact, for other faith groups, in particular the Muslims, there is the reverse problem. Far from wanting secular law to accommodate their religious practices, there is a growing tendency to avoid the secular law altogether. This can happen in various ways. Sometimes the couple may be validly married in English law, and so can divorce in the secular courts, but they may resort to a religious tribunal two reasons. One is to have their status regularized in religious law. A Jewish woman may not be seen by her family and community as validly divorced unless she has been to the Beth Din, a Muslim woman unless she has been to a Sharia council. They may also want to have the financial consequences of their divorce decided by a religious tribunal. Frequently, however, a Muslim woman may not be validly married in English law at all, although she is validly married in the eyes of her religion. In 2015, the Law Commission noted a concern that in England and Wales, a growing number of non-Christian religious marriages were celebrated in ceremonies which were not recognized in English law. This phenomenon is not confined to Muslims, but only a small proportion of mosques in the UK are registered as places where valid marriages can take place. So the couple will have to have a separate civil ceremony if they want also to be married in the eyes of the civil law. And sometimes the couple may be married abroad in a marriage which was valid in the place where it took place, but is not valid in the UK because it was polygamous. 
Curiously, in those cases, the wife may be better off than if she has gone through an unrecognized marriage ceremony here because she could get a secular degree of nullity and the court can then make financial orders. But if a Muslim wife cannot or does not go to the secular divorce courts, she will be limited to the financial provision which is allowed her in Islamic law, usually the return or non-return of her dower. Indeed, this may sometimes be enforceable as a contract in English law, but this will be much less than she could expect from the secular divorce courts. The secular courts base their orders on a combination of need, compensation for the economic disadvantages resulting from the marriage, and the fair sharing of the assets accumulated during the marriage. Sharia councils are likely to apply their own interpretation of Sharia, which is open to different interpretations, but it appears that in England, most of them adopt a conservative or literalist interpretation, which no longer represents the law in Pakistan or Bangladesh. Our government has tended to see this as contracting out of the secular law and not therefore as a problem. There is a pervasive sense throughout family law that it is better for the parties to make their own arrangements than for the court to have to impose them, what we know as private ordering. If a couple are validly married in secular law, they cannot oust the jurisdiction of the divorce court by agreement. Nevertheless, the court will generally respect what they have agreed, even if it is not what the court itself would have done. If a married couple make a separation agreement or agree what the financial arrangement should be when they divorce, then the court will normally enforce these. An agreement to have another body, including an Islamic council, to decide their arrangements may be regarded in the same light as a commercial arbitration agreement and again will normally be enforced. In a case in 2013, the judge approved the party's desire to refer all matters to the New York Beth Din and the eventual outcome, even though the Beth Din did not apply the principles which the English court would have applied. In most situations, private ordering is a good thing, but it assumes that the parties both have a free and equal choice in the matter. This is controversial enough without the religious dimension. As Alison Diddock has argued, I worry about the marginalization of law or of some legal norms from the new framework of the family justice system in favor of only one, an impoverished and gendered understanding of autonomy. She means male gendered. Quote, the it's up to you idea of justice is devoid of a theory of power and uses the sophisticated and seductive language of autonomy to return family living and therefore family justice to this private sphere where the risks and often realities of structural and individual inequality are not the law's concern." End quote. I said something similar in rather less academic terminology when I expressed reservations about the recognition of prenuptial agreements in a case called Radmacher and Granatino in 2010. But the problem is worse if the solution is contracted out to a religious court. The well-known feminist critique is summed up by Mairead Enright. It ignores, quote, the relational nature of marital bargaining where couples are hemmed in by the family's particular hierarchies, expectations, duties, and orders of authority. It ignores the experiences of women who have been deliberately coerced or misled into unwanted choices of law or forum. It ignores the particular patriarchal relations of domination, which often characterize religious contexts, and which even in the absence of actual coercion may limit women's bargaining power. And it ignores the impact of women's poverty on their access to justice, an impact made much worse in the UK by the withdrawal of public funding for legal services in connection with most family disputes. Enright argues that it has suited the British government to ignore all this 
and suggest instead a picture of responsible bargaining within a recognized contractual framework. These are good citizen Muslims to be contrasted with the dangerous outsiders who might perpetrate terrorist attacks. She makes an interesting case about the politics of all of this, but it is not for me to comment on that. I'm intrigued by her conclusion that feminists must, quote, attempt to generate a counter discourse of legal agency to that used by the government to privatize and exclude one which reclaims the virtues and possibilities of partial disloyalty and finds them a place within and where necessary outside the law. I think that by partial disloyalty, she means religious discipline. She means disloyalty to religious discipline. Can we find a way to give these women agency within our secular laws without trampling upon their religious sensibilities? These dilemmas are bad enough in my own country where we do not have separate personal laws. They are even more acute in those countries where the personal law to which a woman is subject depends upon the religious community to which she belongs. Then the possibilities for her to turn to the secular law for relief and justice are even more limited. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Baroness Hale for such inspiring and brave presentation of the issues with which we are struggling here in Israel and not only here, as we heard yesterday, today and tomorrow, these issues throughout the world. And as you so um, rightly and honestly and bravely said that it is the elephant in the room the unspoken, for example, um, on CEDO, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the unspoken uh, word there, religion, is being avoided and only partially referred to, but as you said, it, it is the elephant in the room. And um, just like you uh, emphasized the uh, sensitivity to the power relations and the illusion of uh, autonomy um, that um, uh, sometimes uh, liberal thinkers would like to uh, make us believe uh, under the theory of uh, multiculturalism that um, women do have the free choice to um, uh, choose to opt in or to opt out um, uh, religion, but in the cases that uh, uh, you um, judged and in the cases that you refer to, um, we um, have to be aware that sometimes this is only an illusion of uh, autonomy and uh, the choice is really not their own choice. And uh, as, as we also saw in the uh, Begum uh, case, uh, when you questioned whether the agency of uh, that uh, young woman was indeed her own agency, or perhaps it was an agency that, sh that was attributed to her, but in fact it was her driven to um, uh, make these declarations by her brother or by the expectations of the uh, community. So these are all extremely, extremely intricate um, issues. And uh, you opened up uh, a lot of questions. Uh, I do think that you gave us uh, some hints, some directions into how to tackle these uh, intricate questions. Uh, but I think that uh, we would uh, we are um, left with uh, many unanswered questions and maybe in the next um, 20 or so minutes uh, we can uh, uh, engage with some uh, more um, questions and uh, uh, hear a little more from you. Um, I see that uh, there are a couple of questions uh, um, asked by the um, audience. Uh, 
Um, I will start with um, a question by uh, Sarah um, Rather. I hope that I pronounce her name uh, properly. And uh, I will read out what she um, wrote here in the Q&A section. And I remind the audience that um, you can all uh, submit questions through the Q&A part, which is at the ribbon at the bottom of uh, your screen. So um, Sarah um, Rather asks, um, Lady Hale, why are British Muslim men not denied a decree absolute until they grant British Muslim women a talaq, um, which is the Muslim divorce, and instructed to make payments until they do? Um. <laughs> well, uh, I can't tell you. It will be a political question. The um, Act of Parliament in question does provide for the same power to deny the decree absolute um, if you know, the requirements of religious law uh, to be divorced in religious law have not been met. Uh, it contains a power to do that, but that has not yet happened. The, the court could do the other thing, you know, order maintenance payments pending. It could do that. Uh, I don't know of any case where it has, but I see no reason why it, it couldn't. So that would be possible. But it is a question of the, uh, the, um, the Jewish community as a whole supported the new law but I'm not sure that there is the same cohesion in the Muslim community in the UK uh, that probably the government would want before uh, extending the law to them. And they're not the only ones as well. I mean, the same could be true uh, probably in, in the Sikh religion as well. I'm not entirely sure, but I think it could be. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure either. It's, I think we, mm. need to, we need to mm. look it up. Um, mm. I'm just aware um, of, um, of, a, of a, well, not so new movement, uh, which started in the um, Netherlands. Um, Dutch um, Muslim feminists uh, started an organization which is um, called uh, Femme for Freedom, um, Women for Freedom, um, and they advocate um, for uh, those women um, who, just like the examples that you gave in your presentation, mm. Um, who were married under religious laws outside um, the European, European countries or the UK, um, for example, in Pakistan, um, never registered um, as married in the countries, uh, in the European countries in which they reside. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and then they are not given their Muslim divorces, their talaq divorce by their husbands, and uh, this movement, uh, Farm for Freedom, seeks the involvement of the um, secular legislator um, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, actually, they managed to pass a law which um, does criminalize uh, withholding the religious divorce, even if the couple is not registered as married under the Dutch the, the law the, the law in the Netherlands and they now advocate for this to become um, uh, uh, European Council's um, uh, um, methodology um, uh, to be adopted by, by all other uh, countries so uh, I, I think I think it's really fascinating um, I think there's uh, recently the bill um, the new bill on uh, domestic abuse in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, there was an amendment to also criminalize the Jewish withholding of the divorce. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I think it was withdrawn, um, but it really all just um, uh, uh, demonstrates uh, the question that you posed. Um, in fact, this was a question that was posed also yesterday by Esther Tager in her opening remarks, uh, to what degree does the uh, secular civil legislator or does the state, to what degree is it responsible to, um, to save um, women who are discriminated against uh, by their own religions? Or is it not the responsibility of the religion itself to 
to solve its own problems. Um, uh, so maybe we'll hear a little bit from you um, about this, uh, but, but, but I'd like to read another question that uh, we got from the audience. Um, um, Yofi Tirosh, um, uh, Dr. Yofi Tirosh asks, um, she says, thank you for such a clear insistence that consent should be contextualized and carefully examined. How would you re respond to the argument that there is no difference between a Harvard graduate and an ultra-Orthodox woman, because if we drew such distinctions, we would be paternalistic towards the latter. Mm. Yes, and that is a problem. Of course it is, uh, because there will be people who are perfectly able to look after their own interests, whatever, whether they're Harvard graduates or whether they're ultra-Orthodox women or whatever. Uh, so it is paternalistic to uh, try and um, and protect the one and not the other. Uh, I believe one should try and protect people who are denied their true autonomy and agency, whatever the context. Who knows that Harvard graduate might very well not be the free agent that we think she probably would be, but not necessarily so. After all, uh, my... Uh, my Pakistani mother um, was, was a graduate. She was a Pakistani arts graduate, but she was a, a graduate. But nevertheless, um, I don't think it was really entirely her own choice to go into full Purdue when she came to the UK. I think it was something that um, probably she would rather not have done. Certainly, if, if the story I was told about her throwing off her bail when she left the court is true and I haven't been able to track it down uh, but if that story was true well it does tend to indicate that she was not quite the free agent that she had been presented as being. Mm. Well thank you um, I will just read another comment by uh, Sarah Rathor um, the previous uh, question that uh, we discussed and then I will go on for uh, to another question uh, so Sarah just comments that Sharia councils continue to have a culture of patriarchal domination. None has so far instructed men to make payments to children from the marriage. In the UK, we are seeing a culture pushing Nika only marriages. These are harmful to women. What can we as religious feminists do to lobby the state against this being normalized. Um, so actually this is again a continuation mm. in this intricate relationship between religions that sometimes become even more fundamentalist, more patriarchal, more discriminatory, and the quandary of the civil state legislator, um, do we intervene, do we not intervene? Yes. So maybe you can say a little more about that. Well, it is a quandary, isn't it? Because uh, the, the secular state is reluctant uh, to get involved in uh, matters of religion, um, apart from the Church of England. Um, it, it's very reluctant to do that. Um, I think that's partly uh, because of um, some ignorance about, you know, who should it support? Who should it not support? You know, which is which is the right solution to the problem? I think that's that's a difficulty. Uh, but there's also, of course, the difficulty of being accused of being against the, the religion in question, and that is uh, an accusation which is quite frequently um, uh, banded about. But uh, obviously, if women want to change the situation, or feminists because there are plenty of male feminists want to try and change the situation and want the secular law uh, to uh, get involved, well, then they have to lobby um, government and they have to lobby parliament. And it is a good idea to try and get some respected figures in parliament uh, on their side. Um, and, and in particular, of course, members of the particular religion involved who are in Parliament, if they can be on their side, well, then that is going to make life a lot easier in securing change. So I, I want to um, challenge you a little more on this 
issue of um, intervention because the questions that we've raised so far could be categorized um, and, and it's not that I accept this categorization, I'm just suggesting that they could be categorized as matters that are more um, have to do with the internal affairs of the community um, or you know, reminiscent of the theory of the privacy of the family and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and personally, I do not agree with that. I'm just saying for the purpose of the um, arg mm -hmm. argument, because what I want to raise now is the question of um, what to do um, in those cases where the religious community um, wants to play um, and does play on the field, on the political field, um, and of course take part in, um, in elections, um, have their own representatives uh, um, um, sent to the parliament um, in religious uh, as representatives of the religious parties and exclude women from in Israel the case has been those parties that in fact did not allow women to even become members of the party um, obviously not to it goes without um, uh, uh, obviously, they, they, they cannot have uh, women uh, being elected um, as representatives of um, their parties. Uh, in the Netherlands, again, uh, there was a case of a Christian uh, party, a very small party, that uh, excluded women, did not allow women to run for office um, and, and be um, elected um, as, as, uh, as, as uh, representatives of that party. And that case actually got all the way to the European Court of Human Rights, which in fact said that um, this uh, violates um, gender equality and is uh, uh, prohibited um, discrimination against women. And that led to that party changing its own uh, bylaws. Um, I wonder whether um, you think that in these cases there is more legitimacy from the state to intervene and perhaps um, not allow such parties to uh, participate in the political process. I am, of course, not sure whether it's appropriate for me to comment on something that may be a hot political question in other countries, and in particular in Israel. Uh, it's not for me to tell uh, Israeli politicians or Israeli lawyers what they should be doing. Uh, I can, of course, say that I, I believe that uh, in England, uh, it would, or in the UK, it would not be possible for a party to register as a political party, and political parties do have to be registered if it excluded women, that simply just would not be possible. Um, but uh, I'm not aware of any, um, any such move in the United Kingdom anyway. Uh, and uh, I, I'm also confident that were it to happen, uh, again, it would go all the way to Strasbourg and Strasbourg would say um, mm -hmm. that it was uh, contrary to the European Convention. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll take another question from the audience. Uh, this one is from an anonymous attendee um, who asks whether you have personally worked together with rabbinic judges from London. Have they been cooperative? And could you elaborate, please? Well, the answer to that is no, I haven't. Um, I have not personally uh, worked with, with any rabbinic uh, judges. Um, I. I get the impression that the London Beth Din is uh, moderately um, uh, amenable, um, but uh, that's only, uh, I have no direct experience of that. Well, obviously, it's not, uh, it's not something that I, I would do. Um, we did, of course, have a case that got nothing to do with feminism, Actually, I suppose it probably does have something to do with feminism. We had a case about the criteria for entering the Jewish free school, which was a very good um, state school. Um, and that school would only admit people who were regarded as Jewish 
by the chief rabbi. So in accordance with orthodox principles. Uh, and uh, the pupil in question, the would-be pupil in question, had a, his father was a, a Mazorti Jew, and his mother had originally been uh, a Roman Catholic, but she converted to Mazorti Judaism. Uh, and uh, the chief rabbi didn't recognize the conversion ceremony. So the child was not Jewish. So we had that case, quest, uh, you know, which challenged uh, the school's criteria on the basis that they were contrary, well, they were ethnically uh, discriminatory. Uh, and we in the Supreme Court held that it was. Um, so that was a case in which we had a large and dedicated audience in the Supreme Court throughout the three to four days uh, of argument that took place. It was uh, obviously uh, touched quite a raw nerve. Well, as you say, everything that has to do with uh, Jewish conversions uh, mm -hmm. does have a uh, uh, perspective, a uh, feminist uh, perspective uh, yes. onto it. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, probably in the same vein um, about uh, striking the balance within the religion uh, itself. Um, so here's the question uh, from Professor Francis Radai. Um, who says, Lady Hale, thank you for your impressive talk. You say that the state does not know which voice in the religious community mm -hmm. it should listen to. Does the principle of equality for women not act as the guide? <laughs> well, uh, as Professor Radai, uh, hello, <laughs> nice to hear from you. Um, well, of course it should. Uh, but as I say, we've got this tension with the state wanting to keep out of religious affairs, which they, if it sees it as the, the province of, um, of religion. Um, and and that's, that's why I mentioned this, um, this view that that's wrong. The state should not be uh, taking a back seat uh, and uh, tolerating things that are um, un, unfair and unjust to, to women. It should be doing something about it. That is a view, but it seems not to be the one that's held by our own um, uh, political leaders at the moment. Uh, and indeed it was not made any easier by the Archbishop of Canterbury some years ago, who uh, is the leader of the, of the Church of England, uh, appearing to suggest that um, it was inevitable that uh, Sharia uh, would be uh, recognized and, uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, I'm not sure that is what he was saying precisely. Um, wasn't the easiest of lectures to understand, uh, but it certainly uh, added to the view that um, we should be going, rather than um, intervening to protect the interests of women, we should actually be going down the separate personal laws route, which I do not myself think is a good thing. Um, I am trying to read now uh, the last question that was posted here um, about the Jewish Free School uh, mm -hmm. by Sarah B. Um, okay, so that case, the JFS case, was a disaster for the Orthodox Jewish community, she says since the definition of what is a Jew or who is a Jew is now determined from a Christian perspective, i.e. how often do you attend synagogue services rather than from an Orthodox Jewish perspective, which is who is your mother? The religious authorities for the school shot themselves in the foot, a perfect example of where going to the state will not necessarily get you to a better place. So I guess this is not quite a question, but rather <laughs> A comment mm. which just mm. adds to the complexity of the mm. of the mm. issues. Um, mm. I'm conscious of, of the time, and um, it is becoming late here. I, I would just like to to take my privilege as privilege as the um, host um, and ask you uh, not specifically on the issue of religion, feminism, but rather. Um, feminism broadly, um, 
female judges. Um, as I said in the beginning of the session, you very openly uh, talked about it and wrote about um, your um, uh, self uh, description uh, as, as a feminist and about the importance and the significance of having more women within the judiciary. Um, but you also placed it within the context of um, simply having a more uh, diverse judiciary and the mm -hmm. importance of having more people, people who have uh, had um, varied life experiences um, uh, coming from different echelons of the society, backgrounds, ethnicity, and gender, of course. And what I would like to ask you is whether you see anything which is specifically um, female, womanized, feminist, um, as, as different from the broader um, diversity thesis um, of having a more diversified judiciary? Well, yes, I think there is. I mean, I think there are two things uh, about women. One is that we are half the human race. And so if we are not properly represented uh, in decision-making uh, places, uh, particularly the judiciary because of the enormous power that it has over everybody, well then that is um, giving out the message that half the human race is not as important as the other half. So I think there is something specific and symbolic about that. But there's also the fact that women lead different lives from men. Um, as the Chief Justice of Canada uh, simply put it, we lead women's lives, we have no choice. Because part of that, obviously, is a, is a different um, biology and, uh, and so on, but also it is how other people react to us and interact with us and see us. And it means that the experience of being a woman is fundamentally different from the experience of being a man. No less valid, no less important, but different. Uh, and I cannot say that that is true of every other sort of difference. I'm fairly sure it will be true if there is a difference of ethnicity which is visible. Because I'm pretty sure that the experience of being a person of colour is different from the experience of being a, 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 a white person. Not quite white, of course, but that um, that's by the way. I'm pretty sure that is fundamentally different. And therefore we do need many more uh, judges uh, with that experience. Um, again, for uh, the importance for the community uh, to understand that uh, there is proper representation, but also to have that experience uh, on the bench. Socioeconomic background or professional background, that is important, but I don't think it's quite as important. Well, thank you very, very much for, for that. Um, I will take just one last question and then we will wrap up. And the question comes from uh, Professor Hille Hacker. Um, is there any possibility that former Supreme Court judges from different countries lobby more visibly for women's rights at this, at this moment in time when there is such a backlash from, from different religions, but Christianity in particular, for instance, in Europe or the United uh, States? So this is uh, calling for activism. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think I'm quite active enough, don't you? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> mm. That's quite a good note on which to end, isn't it? <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more on that as well. So I think that uh, this is really the proper moment to really thank you again from the bottom of my heart. And I think I'm expressing uh, uh, everybody's views here. We're ever, ever grateful for you, uh, for participating us, um, for taking part in this conference, for your invaluable remarks and um, wonderful, enlightening, thought-provoking presentation. 
And um, I hope we will also be able to um, have it in writing, perhaps uh, publish it. We'll talk about it later. Um, and I will just tell the audience that uh, this presentation, as well as yesterday's keynote uh, presentations, uh, will be posted on uh, the Rackman Center's website and the Gender Studies Program website with subtitles to Hebrew and Arabic in the very near future. And we hope to see you tomorrow, um, the last day of the conference, uh, two workshops shops and uh, starting at um, what time exactly at 4 p.m. tomorrow thank you Israel time thank you once again Lady Hale be well and um, see you soon God bless and congratulations again for the honorary doctorate thank you very much indeed thank you bye bye